standard training, Massachusetts calls it something a little bit different, but post-certification happens throughout the country. And, and quite frankly, it's, it's really embarrassing with how educated we are in Massachusetts and the resources we have, that it has never been a priority for this to happen. I can speak from the Mass Chiefs have been lobbying for up to 10 years for the state, so the state to license us, to come up with a program to license officers and decertify. This isn't something that was just invented after the tragedies that we've seen around the country where officers have violated you know, the trust that people have given them. And this has been out there for a while, but Massachusetts hadn't prioritized it. Now you know, we see that such, such attention is being brought to us. So it's a good thing, I absolutely support it. I absolutely support certifying officers. So we all start out with an even grade and also having the ability to decertify officers. Nobody more than police officers want bad police officers out of our rank. You know, we want it to be a fair and respectful process. And so we know what's right and we know what's wrong, but we don't want colleagues that are breaking the law or violating the trust that like we spend all this time building with our communities. So I'm a big supporter of the certification process in Massachusetts. I'm grateful that there's a bill out there now, the governor's bill, the Senate's bill, and we'll see the House coming out with this soon. But the really, the bottom line is, government is finally putting money to this. You know, I can't speak as to why other administrations have talked about it, but it has never come to fruition. I'm guessing that it's about money and having personnel to do it. It's going to be extremely time consuming and intensive in a process, uh, but we're at it. And you know, there's a lot of things where the devil's in the details when it comes to certification and decertification. I just want it to be clear so I can give good guidance to the people that serve South Hadley, you know, of what is expected. And of course, you know, we, we know the terrible things, but there could be some things that may not be as clear to us that uh, if we break that rule, that we're then decertified. But in Massachusetts, I think we certify like 100 professions, like teachers and estheticians and you know manicurists and masseuse, and we don't certify police officers. So it's about time that we get to that. Um, and I'm, I'm confident that we will see that happen soon. What I just wanna see is I wanna see it to fruition, right? I don't want something feel good, um, that we're all saying, oh, now we're certifying police officers and the state doesn't put money to it. The leg, or I'm sorry, really, the legislature doesn't put the money to it to allow the governor's office to then hire people in the branch of the executive office of public safety or civil rights office to oversee that. Like, that'll be a failure. And if this, if the law passes and then it fails, really, it's, it's, it's just another kick on police officers. So I just want to see it done right and I, I want to see it through to fruition. And I, I think it's a positive step uh, for all police agencies in Massachusetts. Could you elaborate on what kind of testing would go into getting a certification? Like, is there a psych test? Are there physical tests? Are there bias tests? So right now you would be certified. We would all be certified by passing the police academy. So the police academy is now 960 hours. It does include physical tests. It does include bias training and implicit bias training because that's part of the 960 hours that the academy teaches. Um, most agencies do psychological tests. When I say most, I, I don't know any that don't. There may be some that, uh, you know, very small communities um, that, that maybe don't, but I, I find that hard to believe. 351 police departments in addition to the state agencies. Um, so I know that South Hadley does psychologicals um, on all their uh, up and coming hires, uh, you know, the other agencies that I'm, I'm friendly with and colleagues with and that, that I trust and get advice from, they all do. I can't, I don't know of anybody that doesn't, but I mean, it, it could be like Washington, Massachusetts, you know, population 200, and maybe they don't. All right, thank you. Um, for our next question, it is about the six pillars of principles outlined on the police department's website. It commits to professional conduct, democratic policing, and procedural justice for all people. Could you address these pillars and how they are promoted in your department? 
So, you know, those pillars that came out under Obama, you know, was sort of a result of this crisis of our nation that we had back five years ago, five or six years ago when things were happening in other areas. And, you know, I'm a big supporter of procedural justice and, you know, procedural justice, not only on how our officers treat people, but how I treat our officers, right? Like, I can't expect them to adhere to those concepts of impartiality and fairness and transparency and voice. Like, those are really the four pillars of procedural justice. You gotta give people a voice, right? People will think that we're legitimate if we at least give them a voice. They'll think that we're legitimate if they think the process is fair. They'll think that we're legitimate if we're not impartial to one group, one organization, one neighborhood. And they'll think we're legitimate if we just like let them, if we hear them out and they get their side of it. So we've all been trained in procedural justice and police legitimacy. And, and quite frankly, so we had promotional um, interviews today to promote a new sergeant. And that was one of my questions that I had. So I wanted them to define these candidates. I wanted them to define procedural justice. I wanted them to define police legitimacy. I wanted, to, I wanted them to answer to me how, I wanted to make sure they knew the next leaders, like do they know how these impact each other? And then I wanted to hear how they've used it. Because, you know, they all say, oh, like, it's great. And like, I wanted to hear how they actually practice that. And I wasn't let down by them. Like, I wasn't let down. So, and, you know, we just, I just spoke to a brand new officer who's getting sworn in tomorrow. And I had like my little prep talk with, with her. And I talked about that. I just one-on-one, -on -one, I said, you need to give people a voice. People deserve a voice. I said, you know, when the rubber hits the road, we've got to be fair to people. But the, the one the absolute thing that you cannot violate is giving somebody a voice so they can be heard, so they can air their grievance, so we have good dialogue back and forth. A lot, one of the pillars of um, Obama's 21st century is like about policy and oversight. So with the police department right now, um, their, the policy manual was, was written in 1993 when I came to South Hadley, so it was sort of a it was a boilerplate like copied policy manual and a lot of things have changed in policing in 1993. So when we talk about policy and oversight, we together have been working on rewriting our policies um, pretty much since I, the first month I came in. I think we're 31 policies that have been rewritten. It's very time consuming to rewrite a policy because we need to identify who in the agency is like the subject matter expert on it. Like, I'm not going to write a policy on training. I've never been an instructor. I've never worked in the academy. But wow, we've got an officer that does that. I'm not going to be able to write a policy on juvenile operations. Oh, that needs to be our SRO that does that. So we sort of have to assign the policy rewrite out. We give them sample policies. The officer takes a couple of weeks and rewrites it. And then it sort of goes out into a draft form to all the supervisors, anybody else in the agency that is a subject matter expert to it. And they review it and then we issue it out. So every policy, you know, should really take like two months. So I'm, I'm sort of pushing that. Um, but, but I think that I'm doing it at, at a pace that the officers know what is expected of them because strong policy is about giving them guidance. Like some, some would say, oh, you write policies. That's, that's more ways to get us in trouble. No, that is giving you the tools to do the job correctly. And then if you make a misstep on the job, we refer back to the policy and we're like, see, like that's what you were supposed to do. And that's also part of the oversight, right? So better supervision, holding supervisors accountable. Like we manage now, and I don't know if we always did, but I don't believe in bad officers. Like if an officer makes a mistake, there's always a supervisor that was sort of responsible for that officer. So I put a lot on the supervisors to ensure that they are reviewing their officers' actions constantly. Um, I, we just had the opportunity to promote a new sergeant today. So after the interview, we really had extensive conversation about what my expectations are of um, this new sergeant of supporting the officers and being there and making sure there aren't missteps. And if a misstep happens, we don't hide it. Like we fix it, like we don't hide it. Um, another pillar when we talk about, you know, technology and social media. I think South Hadley, 
it has done a great job on social media even before I came. Um, I, we've got some ideas on some new things that we want to do with technology to sort of get out there a little bit more. We're talking about maybe um, doing a profile in the town reminder, a police profile where we do a story on an officer maybe every month. So that's something that we've been bouncing around. We're bouncing around trying to do a, say, a citizen's police academy using either social media and FaceTime or using the cable to do a citizen's police academy remotely um, now because of COVID. But now that we're all used to doing this, like, I think we could get more people involved. That was, I, you know, I do know there has been some history, you know, in my previous employer, like people didn't come out to that because it wasn't easy. Like, oh, every Tuesday from seven to nine, now I think if we can do it remotely, I think it makes it a lot easier. So we just, we want to use that technology. Another pillar, training and education. Um, in South Hadley, we've revised how we do the training, our in-service training, our professional development to sort of make it more personal to the, to the South Hadley feel. It used to be that officers would, um, you know, for three days, once a year or four days, usually they'd just, they'd be sent off to the police academy and they'd be with Chicopee officers and and Westfield officers and West Springfield and Springfield officers and they'd get their retraining. Now what we did last year, and then COVID sort of ruined this for us a little bit, but we sent our officers to train the trainers. So our officers learned to become instructors in the classes and they were going to teach us all. Well, you know, when we were getting ready, I think we got a couple of trainings done and then COVID hit and we can't be in a room together. So we had to go to online on that but I'm excited with our next training year to do that so, so we can talk about our experiences in South Hadley. We can debrief things a little bit more of things that are happening here. Um, education and wellness, um, and wellness and officer wellness is a big part of one of the pillars, like if our officers are broken, um, ooh, did I just do something? No, if our officers are broken, they can't, they can't do good service to the community. Um, we've developed a peer support program where uh, we have officers that are receiving training on how to debrief their colleagues and how to find resources for their colleagues, whether they're sworn or unsworn communication center that are struggling. Uh, so it's recognizing um, that we have an, an extremely stressful job. Management is extremely stressful. Our communities expect a great deal from us. Our job is so changing right now um, that we need to like help each other. And, you know, I see the, the, the violation that happened in Minneapolis in, in the, the face of, of that officer who killed him. And I just, I wonder like, he has to be broken somehow and his colleagues must have known he was broken to do that. And like, where, where were the colleagues to help, to help him? So um, yeah, so I think that that happens that officers make missteps. So, you know, we now have a chaplain that's a resource to our families and to our officers and the community um, that we can reach out to either privately or publicly uh, where, we can get, where we can get some assistance. So we've got a lot of moving parts happening. Um, transparency, it's, I am a huge supporter as not only a practitioner in government, but as a citizen, right, as a community member. Like, I want to know what's happening in the community I live in. And it bothers me when I have to search hard to find some answers. So we want to be better about that. I, I think you'll see soon our policy manual going online. I'm not hiding the policy manual, but just quite frankly, it's, it's not quite there yet. It's like putting half a manual out. Uh, but I, we'll see that soon. Um, and transparency is... If we go on the road show and, and we're able to do you know, Citizens Police Academy or a, ca a cable show, you know, where we can have community members like you speak to us and we hear from you and we answer your questions. Because what I've learned through, you know, the, the tragedies throughout the country where people have been victimized by us, there are a lot of questions that have happened in South Hadley and there's a lot of misinformation on some things uh, in South Hadley that you know, I'm like, I'm like, oh, I wish, I wish I had already told that. Like, it bothers me that people thought that, like, like we allowed chokeholds. Well, no, we've never allowed chokeholds. So I wish 
that I'd been more proactive and, and I am going to get there to get that information out. The end. Thank, okay. <laughs> Thanks for that thorough answer. I have a few follow-ups to that um, and some were sent in as well. Um, so you kind of touched upon this, but I was hoping you could elaborate more on the safeguards the department has in place to avoid um, incidences like what happened with George Floyd and other instance, instances of police brutality that kind of happen almost in the heat of the moment. Sure. Like the expectation is that, you know, our officers, our supervisors monitor very closely what our officers do, right? So the first level of making sure that doesn't happen is good supervision, good training, and good policy development. So like really, we train our officers in use of force numerous times a year. And part of our use of force training is de-escalation. Like our, our written policy, you know, speaks to de-escalation a dozen times. When we train, we have to de-escalate. We have to verbalize. So as an example, if we're doing so a defensive tactics and I am being, I'm being, I, the trainer is working with me on my baton moves and he's telling me to strike the bag and I go and strike the bag, he's reminding me like verbalize, like, are you saying get back? Are you saying stop? Are you saying don't move? Are you saying drop the weapon? And he's reminding me. And that's the same with our training at the firearms. Like, like we verbalize, like, let me see your hands. And so they're, they're, and they also train us in going from one tool to another tool. So, you know, we do scenario based training where we're faced with what we perceive to be deadly force, right? We perceive to be deadly force. And let's say it's accurate. It's somebody with a firearm. And then that firearm goes away. We're graded on whether or not we now deescalate and we put our firearm away and we use one of our other tools. You know, let's say the firearm, we see it jam, okay? So now it's not deadly force. Now I can go to another tool and they test us on that. So we have strong policies. We review all of our force incidents. Newly, we're going to be doing an annual analysis of our force. We hadn't been doing that. We're gonna rewrite our policy. We've done an analysis, but it wasn't summarized in policy of what the expectations are. So the analysis that we have is, what officers are using force? What, what, what had the offender done? What was the crime? Was our force effective? Was it ineffective? Who did we use a force against? What is the age? What is the race? What is the gender? What is the age? What is the years on the job? What is the gender of the officer? Like we're looking at these, you know, so we can, it's, it's, not, it's not about getting officers in trouble. It's about having like a snapshot, like, oh, do we have a policy failure here? Like, you know, because we asked, did you verbalize? And if the officer checks, no, we didn't verbalize. And if we saw that two times that they didn't verbalize, um, then, then we need to ask ourselves, do we have a policy failure? Do we have a training failure? You know, do, do we need to talk to that officer, you know, specifically? And looking at our force, it, it not only gives us a picture of what we are doing and we analyze that, it is like, what is also happening in the community, right? So if we would have four incidents of force in the last year and our review and analysis shows them all justified, so, you know, when because the first level, the sergeant sees it and the sergeant has to review the force. Then it goes to the lieutenant and the sergeant in charge of training. And then it goes to me. So it's through several levels. If we saw four incidents and let's say they're all justified of using our baton, we'd say, wow, like we, we haven't had to use our baton in some time. What is going on? And we may identify it's substance use um, or substance abuse that, uh, is bringing this. So, um, you know, I, I, I'd like to think that, that we're very reflective in our actions um, and the responsibility is on the officers and the supervisors to write detailed reports and that we look at it. You know, I, I, I hope that protects us. Thanks for that. Um, my next question is, I think it fits, what are your thoughts on qualified immunity? Yeah. Okay, so um, qualified immunity is the, is, is the most concerning part um, in the legislation that has come through the Senate. I've yet to see what the House does. Qualified immunity isn't 
absolute immunity. It doesn't mean like we're immune from everything. It absolutely does not mean that. Qualified immunity puts the test on, should we have known that our actions were illegal? If we should have known they were illegal, then we, we are not immune to that. Um, and as an example, like the law is constantly changing. So before cannabis became lawful in the Commonwealth, you know, there were varying rules. It used to be, there was case law that if you went up to a vehicle and you smelled, and you knew through your training and experience and cannabis was illegal, like you smelled freshly burnt marijuana, that was probable cause that there was more marijuana in that vehicle, cannabis, and you could search it. This is when it was illegal. You could search the car and you could seize that. You could seize that evidence. Well, then the law changed. It was case law that changed. But it, like, it went from a Monday to a Tuesday. It was illegal on a Monday. And then on Tuesday, it's like, oh, can't do that anymore. And we're like, okay. Well, when the law isn't clear to us, we will make missteps. Like what qualified immunity says is that the law must be clear. It must be sufficient. It cannot be unclear. If it is unclear, it is, we're immune to that. So you take away qualified immunity, and I think it opens up officers to liability. And they're afraid then to do their job. And you know what? Our job is a dangerous one. Not all of our job is, is with criminals. Most of our work isn't, but some of it, some of it is. And I think you'll find officers are afraid to do their job. I think this is going to be my opinion and my opinion only. I, I think that this is out there to punish us. And we have thousands of positive interactions with our public on a daily basis. We have thousands and thousands. I think they're attacking qualified immunity to punish us in a backdoor way to try to defund police or to limit police or have police be gone. Because a lot of us will really need to think about where our careers are, are at. Um, and qualified immunity, is it's difficult for me to explain. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an instructor. What I know is if I should have known it was the law, I'm safe you take away qualified immunity and that gets really fuzzy for us. Qualified immunity is an absolute immunity. And I am very upset in what I think that the senators are doing are trying to punish police when again, here in the Commonwealth and here in South Hadley and here in our district, we do great things every day. Um, I have a follow-up question to that. Um, even if the intent of quali qualified immunity is, did they know if it was illegal? Do you see it working that way in practice? Yes, yes, I do. I do. Absolutely. I think that the, the mistakes are mistakes of the head. This is what I see professionally in my two agencies that I've worked with and other agencies. We make a mistake of the head, which it happens. We don't make mistakes of the heart. Can that happen? Like you see when people are victimized and their, and their rights are abused, you know, those are mistakes of the heart, right? But I can make a mistake of the head, right? I, you know, it used to be that you couldn't videotape us. Nope, you can't videotape me. You know, put that video camera down. And then on Tuesday, now you can videotape us. Like, I might have missed that. If I, and I might have missed that because it didn't get to me soon enough. Like, the information, or I didn't process it. Like, I can speak to, well, I, I can remember last year, what I, you know, and when I was trained, you couldn't record somebody. You know, I couldn't be recorded. That, that's what I remember. Um, so, you know, qualified immunity is not all immunity. Officers are still held accountable for their actions. It just needs to be reasonable. And taking away qualified immunity is just unreasonable. I appreciate your um, vulnerability and honesty with that answer. Uh, just a reminder, if uh, you want to send any questions, feel free to send them to me. Thanks to everyone who has so far. Um, another question, does South Hadley have a citizen police review board? We don't. All right. Anything you want to add to that? So, um, you know, I, I don't know a lot about them. I know some big urban areas in Massachusetts have had them and then not had them and they've seen some success or not some success. Um, you know, I think in some communities, do they make sense? Um, when, when the community is so broken and there's such distrust inside the community about what is happening inside the community. Here in South Hadley, 
we see distrust, distrust. It, we could have some local experiences. I'm not going to take that away. That, that certainly people have local experiences where they feel that we, we haven't been fair or appropriate. But I think we act a little bit more like we're responsible a little bit more on the national level. So in South Hadley, I, I appreciate open dialogue. I just, I don't know what the functionality would be, but I mean, I'm not afraid of it. You know, I'm not afraid of people seeing what we do. So I, I, that I can say, I'm not afraid of being transparent in, in how we train, um, how we hire our officers, what our policies are, uh, how we review our actions when it comes to misconduct. Like, I'm not afraid of that. Great, thanks. Um, next question, how are good officers encouraged to report bad officers and how are the good officers protected from retribution if they have to report a bad officer? Yeah, good. so good question. And part of that is that we know that um, if we're on the scene and we see an officer violate a rule or a somebody's rights or somebody's protections, like we're liable for that, is if I did it myself. If you use excessive force on somebody and I view it, it is, it is as if I'm using excessive force. And we don't wanna use excessive force because we don't wanna lose our job, right? So I, I think that that is the protection. Um, you know, officers, you know, it's part of our written policy that we are required to report misconduct of officers. Could I see one officer coming forward and saying like, oh, I saw Jen sleeping in the cruiser. I mean, you know, no, I probably wouldn't see that. But what I would expect in South Hadley and what I do think happens, you know, one officer would go to another and say, hey, you're not doing your job. I, that means I have to do your job. So I, I do think they would call each other on that. So we sort of have like sort of this, what we call like parking lot justice, right? Like, hey, why did I show up at your call before you showed up at your call? Um, and then there's a lot of stuff I think that happens on that level that never comes to me or the lieutenants and that it's taken care of. Uh, you know, I take seriously that, you know, that an officer that does the right thing, that people would not, um, people would not punish them, right? Because th they'd all be in that, they'd all be in that position because they'd be like, oh, I, you know, I, I can't take it out on this guy for doing the right thing because I'll be the next one. I, you know. So, um, you know, and we're small, you know, we're, well, we're, we're actually a larger agency for Massachusetts. I mean, we're, we're on the bigger side, but, you know, we know what we're all doing, right? It's very different if you're in a much larger city of being able to police each other. Um, you know, we, we rely on each other so much so that we need to be on our game. You know, when you're an agency under 100, like, like we know our coworkers. When you hit that over 100, you may not know your coworkers. Like we know them. Uh, we know their weaknesses. We know their strengths. Um, and when it's only two or three officers out on the road, like everybody has to do their best. And this is, this is also this sort of, you know, we said from the get for the murder of George Floyd, not as painful of what the offender did, but all of our police officers in our roll calls, we all said, we're horrified by the three that watched it. Like, how could that happen? Like, we're like, how did that happen that they watched? That was, I mean, everything was horrific. Everything was horrific about that. But we really had a lot of extensive conversations like, why didn't they help? Like, um, so, you know, we're learning, like we've, we've gotten quite the lesson. Um, on the backs of tragedy again, but we've gotten another lesson. Emily? Yes. I have the question that a parent sent in. Sure. Okay. First, thank you, Chief Gough, um, Gunderson, for your good leadership in South Hadley and to all our South Hadley police. My family has had all positive encounters with law enforcement in our town. My son is very aware of the National Dialogue on Policing, its history and current practice, and of horror stories of police abuse, particularly against minorities, of police covering up misdeeds, etc. 
he's quite convinced that even though there are good people involving, involved in policing, the history and culture of policing is inherently toxic and impacts everyone to a degree. If this was your son, how would you address this? I ask this as a struggling parent. Sure, um, valid question, right? So, and you know, I had to talk to my children about police brutality and what has occurred and how I want to make it better. Um, and I don't think I, I got in maybe this, the amount of detail that I'll get in now, you know, I, I believe in policing. I, on this very local level, I believe in South Hadley. I believe in this region. I believe in Massachusetts as being a progressive state. I believe in the Eastern part of the country being very progressive when it comes to training. I mean, 351 you know, local police departments in Massachusetts, so 18,000 police departments in the country, 800,000 officers. We do thousands and thousands of positive, productive, kind things on a daily basis. I do get bitter when we're all painted with the same brush, but I also realize that no longer can we say here, and no longer can I say, oh, well, that's not South Hadley. Well, that's not Massachusetts. Like, that's not, like, that's not valid anymore because it is out there. Um, it is horrific. It is terrible. Um, but we do so many positive things a day. I mean, I think I want to acknowledge and wrap my head around that, like, police don't own racism, right? We don't. We are products of communities, and we're products of education, and we're products of upbringing, and we're products of this country. So I would say our disappointment should be, like, with, with no more on policing than on all of our country for systems and institutions that have had disparate treatment to people of color, like housing, medicine, you know, well, I mean, what has COVID taught us about how people of color are disparately affected by this in, in education, in banking, uh, in job opportunities. So I, 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 think, I think it's a lot bigger than police, what we're dealing with right now. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm defending officers, but I'm acknowledging that some terrible wrongs have happened and we want to be better. And this is what I want to hear. This is what I hear from my colleagues. This is what I hear in Massachusetts from the Mass Chiefs. I mean, we're not fighting reform. A lot of that we've wanted. Um, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not painting us all with that same brush. No different. I, I'm saying that, like, I guess we're America. We're just, you know, we're caught on camera and it's more obvious. Um, and they're horrific. And I'm not justifying any of those actions. But I've also read some other horrific actions, people trying to get housing and trying to get jobs and, you, you know, and, and biases. Um, we all need to do better. And I think that's what I said to my kids. We all need to do better. I said, police own some of this. We've done some terrible things, but we all, we all need to be better and we all need to be fair and we need to learn from this. I think that's what I told my kids. Jen, if I could give an, uh, a witness example about a month ago, it was very warm. I walked my dog by the river and I noticed two people of color walking up Ferry Street. They had backpacks on. You know, I was intrigued. I thought, I wonder if they live down there or what's going on and they're not walk they're walking. And where are they walking from? Where are they walking to? By the time I walked my dog and came back up Ferry Street at the corner, a fairy in Hadley. I was so moved. A police officer had stopped on Hadley Street. And I thought, oh, I bet somebody called on these people and whatever's going to happen. And I saw the police officer hand the, the folks water bottles because it was such a warm day. And I thought, that is the new kind of policing. 
or the policing we need to get the word out that's how that's how we should be doing it thank you for sharing that thank you mm -hmm. thank you thanks Lori. um i have two questions left and then we can open it if you continue sending me questions or if you want to ask jen a question directly you can do that soon um could you talk about restorative justice practices and what's happening with starting restorative justice at south hadley police department so as of now restorative justice is really only occurring with youth and juveniles but i had a really encouraging conversation last week with the district attorney's office that wants to help spearhead and guide police departments in the area um, with providing restorative justice for um, our adult offenders and for people that don't know what restorative justice is it's a process where we bypass the criminal justice system i.e the courts um, for somebody who violates you know certain levels of crime where like almost like a committee gets with you, you know somebody who violated the law and we'll say offender you know and i it's tough to say it if it's like trespassing ooh, the offender but so somebody who violates the law and somebody who's been victimized by that and sort of gets them together and like how can we make you the the person who was victimized how can we make you feel whole about this and how can we really make an offender understand like how them trespassing you know on somebody's property with an atv and tearing up their lawn like how that like really affected them and how restorative justice can be a little bit more effective than going to court and generally it's a it's inconvenient and it costs you money and a lawyer makes money and it takes up the court's time um so that's sort of the idea behind it it's it's not for every offense and it's not for every person and it's not for everybody who's been victimized they may not think that that is the response that they want so we you know i had an encouraging conversation and i think more is going to come of that basically is like would itself hadley be interested in restorative justice there's an organization that has done it in middlesex county they've had some success on it and 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 we were one of five police departments that was being called and sort of like leaders in this and i, I was i was really proud that we made south hadley our town made one of the five that would be open to this because i think some departments would be like ah i don't get it it just goes right to court you know somebody violates the law we do with the court we let the judges deal with it but just being a little bit more open so it's a discussion you know i i absolutely support restorative justice with juveniles unequivocally anything we can do to be least coercive with youth to help them make better decisions and you know i do think that it's silly some of the things that we send to court we have to because that's sort of how we do it and you broke the law and you broke their their stuff and you go to jail like for non-violent offenses it doesn't maybe make a whole lot of sense and waste a whole lot of money that could go to other programming. Um, so I, I think we'll see something uh, with that in the future. And that reminds me that I need to follow up with the DA's office because they forgot to send me the name of the organization in Middlesex County so I could call them. So I, I think we'll see more of that in the future. Great, thank you. Now I have two more questions. <laughs> Some were sent in. How diverse is our current police staff? uh we currently have 28 sworn members we're, we're budgeted for 29 we're down one we have five females um uh we have one black officer 27 white officers and two that are white hispanic um you know sort of reflective of self hadley you know we hire a lot of our hiring is from people that live in self hadley because we're a civil service agency we are restricted because we're a civil service agency of who we can hire um, people take a state test and um, you get extra points if you live in the town um, if you live in south hadley and you go to the top of the list so really we pull from south hadley residents that is great because people like are hired they're committed to the town they know the town they're committed they were raised here their parents were raised here um, but it does limit our ability for diversity. Uh, 
two years ago, we had two females. Now we have five, me and two other hires. Um, I can only be credited with me and one hire. But, and as I walked in the door, one female's name came to the top of the list. And that's really it. If your name comes to the top of the list, your ba a background's done on you and you get hired. It doesn't give us the ability to be um, selective with, with race or eth ethnicity, um, unfortunately. Again, because we're pulling from South Hadley, which is a good thing, but what I, what, I, what I think there'd be a great value to having more diversity, maybe not of the town, but of our region, right? So South Hadley may lack in diversity. I mean, you just walk around and you go into the schools and, and you see limited students of color. So I think where we lack of diversity, but regionally, we're really diverse, like between Holyoke and Chicopee. I mean, they're part, like, you know, part of our community. They drive through our community. Um, Amherst and what the university brings in Mount Holyoke and the diversity of their student body. Uh, so we're reflective of it, South Hadley. We're, we're probably not reflective of, of the region. Great, thank you. Um, our last question I have on my end is the South Hadley Police Department open to reallocating some of its responsibilities to people like social workers, addiction experts, mental health counselors, and so forth. Is there a plan to get more professionals like these involved in responding to mental health or nonviolent calls? Absolutely not, no kidding. So really we would, right? Um, right now we have a drug abuse response team, DART officers, that um, their job is to go out to um, try to meet with people that have had non-fatal overdoses and follow up with those consumers, those community members, and to encourage um, you know, these, these residents to seek help. And sometimes we do go with a recovery coach, not always, um, but often you know, our DART officers, we have five that have special training in doing this, uh, will communicate to the recovery coach, oh, I'm going to somebody's house, what are the beds at? Here are some circumstances. So we do that a little bit. We'd love to do that more if there was more funding, like, we, like, you know, five years ago, the thought that police officers would go out and talk to people suffering from drug abuse and be like, you know, what is your, you know, access to clean needles? And like, do you, how is your wound care regimen? And do you know where you can go? Like, we wouldn't have done that. Like, so we are taking a, a social services role because there's nobody else to do it, right? Because we're 24 hours. Like, who are you going to call? Like, are the fireworks happening tonight? Call the police and ask them. Um, you know, so we take that role because there's been less. Um, do I want to lose staff for that? No, because if, if you took that off of our plate, I'd want to do other things. Like I would want to have a dedicated traffic enforcement officer so we could do analysis on speeding in certain areas and where crashes are. So, you know, I'll, I'll be a little selfish. Like I would use those personnel to do other things, to do other reach, to deal with youth in some, some different ways. Working, well, we are right now, we've got crisis intervention team officers. It's a fairly new program that we have. Um, and, you know, we have one of our officers is amazing working with the community that's suffering from mental illness and, and in crisis. And she's got such a great skill set. So we're working on trying to get a like maybe four hour a week clinician that could go out with our CIT, crisis intervention team officers, but it's not always just people in crisis, it's just you know other mental illness or disabilities and go out with a clinician like, how are you doing? Uh, you know, Are you getting the help that you need? Do you know what your help are? You're a senior, do you know that these are some resources? You're a vet, you know, these are some resources. You know, just today we were talking about um, myself and, and the officer that oversees the program about you know, one of our community members who, who is of Indian descent. So I asked the officer, I said, hey, do, are there any clinicians that, that are, are Indian? Because I, I think this woman would talk to somebody, but I think culturally, so we had some discussion about that. And she's like, oh, well, you know, I'll call over to BHN and to see if they know a name of somebody. And then we're like, oh, it has to be a female because we think that culturally she wouldn't talk to a male in, um, in, in just some of the struggles. So yeah, we'll share, we'll share it, <laughs> like we will. Um, and hopefully people will do it better than we do it. Like we never 
got into policing to be social workers or to be in schools as educators. I mean, but those were things that are asked of us. And we've, we've tried to, you know, learn some skills along those lines to be, to be better and to do an efficient job. But we, we're not social workers and we're not clinicians, but we do try to do our part. Um, to be knowledgeable about it. But 25 years ago, like when I started in policing, we didn't get two calls a day for people in crisis or people um, with mental illness. Like they were calling somebody, but they weren't calling the police. Now, like we're the call because there's nobody else. And I think we can talk to the problems with there being less hospital beds and less beds for children that are in crisis. And they sit in the ED for 48 hours. Like that's something that like we try to teach ourselves. Like don't encourage families, you know, unless it's absolutely necessary to go to an ED with a youth because they could be there for days. Like, try to get them some support. Try to, so we get phone calls of who they can call so they can get some support in the house. But, you know, we try our best, but we're not the best at it. So, point taken. Where can uh, citizens, anyone find statistics on what kind of calls you respond to? Like percentage that are traffic stops, percentage that are violent, percentage that are that DART would respond to? Sure, so, so great question. We have always had on our website, www.southhadleypolice.org, our public arrest log. Those are people that we criminally charge. So that has always been there even before I started. And we've always had what is called our public call log which shows the date we went to the call, where we went. That's where you'd go if you saw like a police on Ferry Street <laughs> at two o'clock and you'd be like, hey, what went on? So you look back in the week and you'd see if the call was there. But the call may not show up because there are a lot of privacy issues with those. Um, you know, we don't, our, in, so in our website explains what calls are not on our public call. But now I have prioritized doing a monthly summary of all of our calls for service. And it's not a privacy issue, so I can't put on our weekly public call log that we went to Ferry Street, to Ferry Street for a domestic. But I can say in the month of June, we went to 18 domestics. I can't say that we went to you know, 42 College Street for a crisis call, but I can say that we went to 11 crisis calls in June. So the last six months of our overall calls are up there. And, and we want to improve that a little bit more. I've got a, it's an ongoing discussion of how we can be more transparent with some of our calls and some of our summaries, but they can go to our website and they can see that. Everything we do is public unless it's not public because it's excluded because of an exemption of the law. Awesome, thank you. Um, that was it for questions that I received. Lori, do you have any more? Oh, she's muted. <laughs> um, ask if anyone else has lasting questions or unanswered questions. And Jen, you're you welcome emails if people have follow-up questions after this, correct? Absolutely. Gunderson J at SouthHadleyPolice.org, and that's also on the website. Um, give me a day or two to respond, but I'm, I'm usually very good at responding to emails. Um, and I'd like, you know, I appreciate any feedback on how we can better promote what we're doing. So that's, you know, I am so appreciative to be here right now and to spend time with you all, because I think like I'm getting educated on what some of the priorities are in the community. Like you want to hear about transparency and I'm like, Ooh, got to do that. Like procedural justice, like reminder, <laughs> like, I need to follow up. Why didn't I get an email with that organization? So um, these are great. They, we need more of them. Um, and you know, I, I, I want to talk about the good work we're doing. And I also want to, I also want to hear when like, you know, we, we could have done something a little bit differently or why did you do that? And we may agree to disagree as to why we did something. You know, I won't forget the conversation and I won't forget the feedback. Betty, I see that you're unmuted. Do you have a question? Uh, no, all well, my questions were answered. I just did want to ask the chief if she spells her name. Is it S-O-N or S-E-N? I'm Norwegian. S-O-N? Nope, that's S-E-N. S -E -N. Okay. S-E-N. Okay. Yep. Good. Thank you. Um, 
and Steph thank you for uh, <laughs> for answering our questions. Appreciate it very much. Stephanie, are you I, I just got one? Say, yeah, I just want to say thank you so much. This was wonderful and helpful. And when COVID is over, will you come back to our preschool in your uniform to read a story? Because that is the most exciting day ever. <laughs> I remember that. I remember that. That was a great time. We would love to do that. I'll bring some more friends along with me. You know, it's those little, it's those little things that uh, they really bring a smile to our face. It's like a, it's a great way to spend 30 minutes. So thank you for the invite and we will absolutely come back. Any other questions? Hear me? Can yeah, we can hear you, Betsy. Jen, we just wanted to, we initially reached out to you because we were so grateful to you for coming and introducing yourself and the department's goals to us as you did when you first came to town. And when all of the past, recent past events unfolded and police were so vilified, we thought about you and wanted you to know that, um, that we care about what you're doing and we appreciate what you're doing and we wanted you to know that. Thank you very much. Thank you. It, it, it has been, it's been difficult and it's, it's been stressful, but we've received some great support and we've got some great guidance out of this too, right? Like we want to be better. Um, and, you know, we've heard some things where we've, you know, we, we could have done this better and we need to do that better. So uh, great support from the town. Um, you know, we appreciate you know, we, we appreciate staffing levels that the town allows us. And um, so thank you very much for letting me be here. You're welcome. Lori, do you wanna uh, uh, yes. close? Uh, thank you, Jen. However we can be in collaboration, you can count on us. You see these faces before you, but also a, many uh, exponentially uh, uh, supportive people. I want to thank Emily for an exquisite job of hosting this and for the outreach team for suggesting that this happen. Um, again, this is, this is pivotal and this brings um, honesty and authenticity to all of us as we move forward in uh, building unity. Thank you. Thank you all. And I will talk to you all soon. So email any follow-up questions, but thank you very much for, for letting me be here. Great, thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.